name is Chris McMahon. I'm one of the designers of the Night Cage. I'm the Chris who has the beard. Uh, and I'm here with Global Executive Creative Director for Massive Music, Elijah Torn. Hello, Elijah. Hey, Chris. Uh, so you know, one of our, uh, Elijah has been kind of uh, a fan of what we've been working on here for a very, very long time. And we're very fortunate that because of the, um, the support we had at Kickstarter, we were able to put together a soundtrack to go along with the Night Cage which allows people to uh, play along with them in real time. Um, and so Elijah with how we made that happen. I'm very thrilled. And, you know, since the first first time you guys showed me the game years ago and the, the work in progress of the game, um, I've been wondering how we could be involved and how we could collaborate with you on this. So when you said, like, let's let's make a soundtrack for this, let's make a score, I was like, Awesome, fantastic. Let's figure this out. <laughs> we we couldn't be happier with that. And also it's turned out fantastic. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna like go through some of our favorite tiny pieces of how of what it sounds like and kind of talk a little bit about uh what decisions led to those to that to this sound and also you know what what it goes to in the game. Like what is it about and how does it tie to the theme of the night cage? You know, we made a very thematic game. And we wanted to make sure the soundtrack reflected those themes. And so we're going to talk a little bit about how how it does. Yeah, I, I was going to say, like, the amount of time that we spent talking about those themes and, and brainstorming and, and trying to connect musical elements to the thematic elements of the game as well were, were super important and helped shape the, the sound of, of the game as well. We spent a lot of time timing out how these tracks work to make sure that it felt as though it would last for a whole play session and that as you played it would accompany where you were in the narrative arc of the game you know when tension started to build in the game when tension started to build in the soundtrack it's literally down to like minutes or seconds of that time this is how we've timed this out and fig figuring out how we could create a palette that would work with that and it would feel like moments even if you were a few seconds off, knowing that it, it all sort of maps out as, as happy accidents, as they would say sometimes, but they're not, they're not accidents. They're all pre-planned and, and you know, we tested through to make sure these moments and these arcs happened in, this, in the story of the game, no matter who's playing or what speed they're playing, right? But it's it's different than like than than video game play yeah. where the sound changes as you move room to room or you know terrain to terrain. This this is how we had to anticipate that and create based on that. Yeah, yeah. because in an interactive with a digital game, you know, structurally it can it can tell when you've done that thing. But our soundtrack has to stand alone and understand where you're going to be without having to know what you've done. Um, and making something that made that did that without feeling like generic or unconnected was a big challenge for us. Um, and we'll So this first piece, uh, Awake in the Dark, you know, plays off of the introduction in the rules and the video that kind of sets up the sets up the night cage. Um, and we wanted this to be a piece because one of the things about board games is that it's a physical experience and that part of the experience is literally setting up the game, like the anticipation of opening the box and putting out all the pieces and getting everyone right around and ready to do it. And we wanted a piece that would allow you to give you time to do that and set the tone while you're doing that setup so this is not even it's partially this is this is the this is the the kind of openness of the first few turns but it's also more importantly a way for like the setup of the game itself to feel part of the experience to make that whole setup come together and you know, we 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 talked a lot about uh how to start off the soundtrack so it, it would it could still morph and end in the same place and loop back as as you play longer and longer but what can you do to start that puts you in this space and puts yes. you in the scene, but almost starts off as a background. Um, yeah, yeah, it's an overture, but it's not an overture that like like demands your attention. Like we're starting now, it's it's part of the texture of, of setting the game up and getting it going. It, it's the, the auditory of here's the feel of the walls that are surrounding you. Here's um, 
you know, the knowing that your friends are there, but you can't see them. Like it, it was, how do we create that without overwhelming the players as well? Right. It's a sort of encroaching sound. And I think this, this piece does, it encroaches, like it gets a little louder and has this, this slow rumble that builds as the tension builds as you're playing and as you're figuring out gameplay. Yeah, I think I think also Awake in the Dark also sets up as you're feeling the board, as you're feeling the pieces and 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 setting up the game, you're also connecting to the textures of 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 the score as well. It's it's setting up what the room would sound like, what the cave would sound like as well. And it's a sort of slow rise, as Chris said, to allow you to have that time to set up, but also to start making your first pieces and getting a feel for the game and for for this world sonically as well. This, this section, you know, kind of comes after the setup. You started to use, it's the most structured piece of the soundtrack and it's the point of the game where you've started establishing the structure, right? You started to find your space in, in the labyrinth. You started to build up kind of an idea of where you are and what you want. Um, and musically, we're reinforcing that with having the most classical kind of arrangement. You have the cello and, and, and the piano, both of which are inspired by the music we used in the Kickstarter trailer, which create like a real sense of unease by taking something you feel very recognizable and sort of recontextualizing them into this kind of unknowable space there are elements that are melodic and there are elements that are are traditional song but there's so much of it that soundscape as well to to start with this and to connect it to the to the kickstarter as well so that there's a a connection there for fans there's also some um some of the bow scrapes from this this beat up old upright bass that we had recorded down a stairwell as well so and we're peppering in the the more uh, creepy haunted elements in the beginning of this as well as having a song structure what kind of tools do you bring into this to kind of fill the creative vision you have for this i think i think once we like we figured out sort of the, the structure and and what the the takeaway was and what we were going for um the actual making of the music a lot of it rested in in collections of field recordings that i have that i thought evoked that but changing the you know using ableton and pro tools to change the pitch and tempo of that as well so that they do become unrecognizable um working with with a bunch of hardware reverbs and and delays as well so that we had more physical control over over what that sound and that space would be. Um, a, a lot of this was run through the input of my Moog Sub 37, which has the ability to filter incoming elements as well. So I could play drums through that or run drums through the filter and through um, oscillation as well as, you know, not having it be a traditional synthesizer as well, but using some in the box elements as well as, you know, software synthesizers, but back through that filter too. I think that that decision to use, to start with recordings, like field recordings, recordings of life, things that you would recognize in the original context, and then yeah. intentionally distorting and degrading those pieces with the, with the tools you chose, I think works great for this. Cause it's about like, you're almost at the edge of like, I, I almost feel like I understand this. I almost feel like I have something to grab onto here, but it completely eludes you the entire time you're both playing and listening to the soundtrack. Right, uh, yeah, and, and I think a lot of the, the elements that were, you know, traditional acoustic or electric elements were, you know, either processed that way or recorded in a space differently as well. A lot of the, the bowed upright bass is you know recorded down a hallway or down a stairwell with a microphone there to create our own reverb chamber as well to add to that layer but then when you change the the audio file for that and slow that down it adds it adds a distinct terror to it too which is which is a which is a blast i'm sure my my neighbors don't love me when i'm playing this <laughs> loud i know my kids get a kick out of playing this in the car really loud but
So this is the part where usually in this in the gameplay thing you've encountered your first of the the wax eaters the monsters that pervade the the base version of uh the night cage and the soundtrack is largely devoid of clear sonic landmarks it's about a general sensibility of unease and disorientation uh, but here is a clear uh sonic identity uh, tied to one of the most jarring pieces you could possibly draw and play which is the monsters the wax eaters um, so it's not necessarily one to one, but the idea of this, of this big, heavy, momentous thing kind of evokes the idea of this lumbering, dangerous thing that, that reaches out and grabs you from, uh, from the darkness. I think the word lumbering is, is key in there. And it's, it, it's not the only rhythmic element in the score, but it's definitely one of the most percussive that really announces itself and, and adds to this terror. Like the, you know, there's a tease and we sort of tease this swirling uh, sound leading up to that, but then we're, we're hit with this big percussive element as well. Um, that, that sounds uniquely organic too. It's not, it's not like an electronic drum beat suddenly comes in out of nowhere. It's still, it's still tied to the wax eater itself. And a huge amount of the instrumentation here is designed to be hard to, to pin down. We really went out of our way to try and find sounds that weren't organic, other than the ones that are designed to be very clearly like this. Is this. But a lot of these are like, what is that? Like, what, like, what is causing this? And to feel like you're never quite able to pin that down ties directly into the idea of not being able to pin down like what's happening in this maze. Where are you? What's going on? What's your status? You know, these things defy categorization, and the soundtrack carries that theme forward, of refusing to be known in full at any one time. Yeah, living in that uncanny valley of music of whether or not it's uh, synthetic or organic or a real instrument, an acoustic instrument, it all just lives in the space of the night cage. And, and adding to that, to, that, uh, to that level of not understanding where you are necessarily. So again, as a, a soundtrack tied to major events, you know, thing that happens very frequently in the players is that they get hit by wax haters, inevitably they can't escape forever. And then their, their candle goes out. We wanted to capture the sense of disorientation and panic that comes with being in a labyrinth that you only know by this tiny, tiny light. And then to lose that, how does that feel? This is not just a, a gameplay mechanic, but it's an entire experience for the player and the character. And we wanted to capture that sense of, of being untethered, even in this place that already has no real context or orientation. Most soundscapes and textures, it's about these really long delays and creating this really long space. But in this universe where it's claustrophobic, we're in a tight space. You need to know that there's walls on either side of you that are really close, but there's also this vast labyrinth around you. You can hear your friends. You know other people are there, right? Like you know that there will be, there will be, you know, the wax eater closing in on you. But how do you create that sonically and still make it a textural, like ambient soundscape as well? So we we talked a lot about, you know. Well, in that scenario, you would hear the sound immediately because you're right next to a wall, but then something happens after that. So we did a lot with you know, sort of engineering the reverbs and sculpting the delays for typical soundscapes that they immediately slap back. And then there's a long decay after that. Because if you snap your hands in an underground labyrinth, You'll hear it immediately, but then it might ring out after that. So we sculpted a lot of these elements, including the percussive ones, to have that sort of immediate attack. But then there's like a, almost a gap, and then it decays after that.
Taurus, the the sixth track on this on this um, score, is is one of those examples where you have this sound that has just been endlessly floating through the labyrinth. You know, you'll never be in the labyrinth at the same place, but the sound might not ever leave the labyrinth. So you have, you know, these string elements that were familiar in the second cue and ephemera in the beginning, like as you kick it off, but they've come back to you and they're degraded now and they've fallen apart and you're uncomfortable, they're uncomfortable. And like your experience, you've had an experience playing this game so far, but so has the sound as well. And it's, and it's translated into sort of more unsettling, uh, more unease with the instruments that we consider, with what we considered to be an instrument in the beginning. Yeah, and I, I love I love the the physicality of that decision making of take of the idea of like what does an echo sound like in a space that is constantly changing? Do those do those sounds like do they go away or do they persist and and mutate and and distort? Um, and even thematically, the idea of, of something you recognize stored in itself at this point in the game, you've probably seen the majority of the mechanics you're going to encounter. You've seen the wax eaters and the candlelight and the, and the pits and the lights out. So all these things are coming back to you, but they're never the same as you left them, right? It's a game about constant force change. Um, and, you know, not only is this track evoking the physicality of that space, but also the thematic part of it, where change is, even if you thought you understood and knew, or constantly be changed and, and contextualized, not always for the better for, for you. So Final Flicker is, is the part of the game where you're no longer adding tiles to this and the game is starting to kind of draw to a, a dizzying and chaotic close. Um, but at the start of that, uh, you have a bit of a moment where you're kind of trying to build that plan together and kind of capsulate that with these really distinctive uh, guitar parts. Now, these guitars are unique to this and they've actually been featured throughout the entirety of the soundtrack, though, of course, as everything, they are distorted to the point where you feel like you might recognize it, but not really. Um, but here they're at their clearest. And this is actually uh, original guitar recordings from uh, David Torrent, right? Yeah, that's uh, uh, so much of this has been a collaboration with my father, who's um, sort of cut, cut his teeth and pushed the boundaries of what a guitar can sound like as a texture and as, as, as a soundscape um, for, for most of my entire life, if not all of it. Um, so to, to work with that and, and to have this moment where it does stand out and it is, um, recognizable guitar and to have it be his guitar in there as well, I think really, um, adds, adds this moment to the gameplay as well. We sat down and we talked and, you know, discussed the, the idea with him for, for hours and he sent hours of guitar recordings that are a lot of them don't sound like guitars they, they might sound like drums or they might sound like a synthesizer but they're woven in throughout the score but this this really is the like the the penultimate guitar moment in this as well we couldn't be happier having been able to collaborate with you and with the whole team at massive and with, with david torn on putting this soundtrack together and uh, hopefully our audience will feel that collaboration yielded good results. Um, yeah. Hopefully this gives us some insight into how the soundtrack come together with the, with the game. If you are one of our um, uh, deluxe all in backers who went for the whole experience, this is going to be available for you now on SoundCloud. You should, if you, if you're seeing this, the link should already be available to you. And if you haven't, hopefully will this be available to you in the future uh, in other forms, but uh, we encourage you to, to, to play this with your, your sessions of uh, the Night Cage. And if you end up hearing independently, maybe, maybe you'll want to add the other pieces of this into that as well. I'm super excited for people to listen to this and, 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 and listen while they play too. It's, it's what it's created to do and, and very, very excited. Mm -hmm.